It's good to see you here this morning. I'm thankful for your presence. If you are visiting with us, we're very glad you're here, and we invite you to be with us any opportunity you have. I appreciate the songs that we just sang together and the reading of God's Word. In just a moment, I'll be reading from that chapter that has served as the basis for a number of lessons lately, and that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you have your New Testament, I encourage you to open with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We come now to the end of the chapter where we have a number of great lessons. Last Sunday morning, I preached a sermon on the theme, Pray Without Ceasing. This is one of the duties we all have as Christians. In that sermon, we noted the connection between the command to pray without ceasing and the instruction to rejoice evermore, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16. And we also saw in that sermon that as we pray without ceasing, we also give thanks in everything, verse 18. Today, I want to share with you some additional Christian duties. These duties, I am persuaded, when kept, will ensure that the church remains strong. The church at Thessalonica, established by the Apostle Paul on the occasion of Acts chapter 17, was established under severe persecution. Paul was very concerned about this young congregation. He wanted these brethren in Thessalonica to remain strong. And the duties we are about to read were duties that, if they kept, would help them remain strong. They would remain strong individually and congregationally. You and I, members of the Chapman Church of Christ, if you have obeyed the gospel, these are duties that, if you apply to your life, will help you to be strong and, in turn, this congregation will remain strong. Our lesson today is captioned, Christian duties which will keep the church strong. Christian duties which will keep the church strong. Beginning now with verse 19. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesies, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, these are the words of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 19 through verse 22. We have in this reading five Christian duties, two of which are negative and three of which are positive. And so let's think together about these duties which will keep the church strong. In the first place, quench not the spirit, verse 19. What did Paul have in mind when he wrote by inspiration to first century Christians, quench not the spirit? The language used, the term quench, is a word that was used in reference to putting out a fire. If you put out a fire, you quench a fire. You may put out a fire by smothering the flame with a blanket. Just as you might smother a flame with a blanket, it's possible to smother the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And that's the idea of the text. Paul is saying, do not put out the fire of the Spirit. Do not stifle the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do not suppress the Holy Spirit. As we think together about this teaching, bear in mind that first century Christians possessed miraculous gifts. Many of them did. First Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 8, we have a listing of nine spiritual gifts that various ones possessed in the first century setting. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, 
to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Nine spiritual gifts. That is in the background of this statement, quench not the spirit, written to people who were very familiar with spiritual gifts, miraculous spiritual gifts. Paul wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, stir up the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the laying on of my hands. 2 Timothy 1, verse 6, stir up the gift. The Apostle Paul apparently had given Timothy a miraculous gift. The Apostles had the ability to lay hands on others and transfer miraculous power. And now Paul writes to Timothy and says, stir up the gift. That connects well with the statement, quench not the spirit. Rather than quenching the spirit, stifling the influence of the spirit, Paul encouraged others to hold on to the influence of the Spirit. Allow the Spirit to be manifest in their lives by the way they lived. Today, we can quench the influence of the Spirit in our lives. No, we don't possess miraculous gifts today. No, those things have passed away. More on that in just a little while. We no longer have the miraculous gift of healing or tongues or prophecy. But the Holy Spirit is still operative in our lives. He still operates through the teaching of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit gave the Word. And you and I are influenced by the Word to the extent that we allow that Word to influence our lives. That's why we have in Ephesians 5, in verse 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus, Be filled with the Spirit. The sister epistle to Ephesians is the book of Colossians. Meaning that in Colossians we have very similar instruction that we find in Ephesians. Be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. The parallel to that in the book of Colossians would be Colossians 3 and verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. How is it that we could be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18, by allowing the Word of Christ to indwell our hearts. Let the Word of God dwell in you. So on the one hand, Paul writes, let the Spirit dwell in you. On the other hand, he writes, let the Word dwell in you. So the Spirit operates in our lives through the teachings of the Word of God. In the first century setting, maybe there were people who were neglecting the use of their own spiritual gifts. Maybe they were discouraging the use of spiritual gifts in the lives of others. Maybe they were ignoring the teachings that others were doing as they were led by the Spirit. Whatever the case, you and I can still stifle the influence of the Holy Spirit, not that he operates in a miraculous way, but we can stifle his influence as we ignore the teachings of God's word. We are to be filled with the word. Colossians 3 and verse 16. In Galatians 5 and verse 16, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How could you today walk in the spirit? Well, you walk in the Spirit as you walk in keeping with the Spirit's teachings revealed in this book. The Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, guided them into all truth, John 16, 13. And we have all truth recorded in the Word of God today. And as we walk in keeping with it, we walk in the Spirit. 
But if I ignore the Holy Spirit's warnings, if I do not appreciate the Holy Spirit's promises, if I fail to apply the Holy Spirit's instruction in my life, to that extent, I quench the Spirit. I know you don't want to quench the Spirit in your life. You want the Holy Spirit to influence you through the teaching of God's Word in a practical way. How could you or I today quench the Spirit? Go back to chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians and notice in the opening part of this chapter, Paul writes to Christians in Thessalonica concerning sanctification. Verse 3, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So he writes about fornication, a sin that was prevalent in first century Thessalonica and present in our day, in our country, in our state, in our county, and so you and I need to think about morals that God has set forth in his word, his standards of morality. If we ignore the teaching of the Spirit regarding fornication or other moral issues, then we stifle the influence of the Spirit. As you continue to read there, in chapter 4, down in verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Now look at verse 8 in that context. He, therefore, that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. See how the Holy Spirit is connected with the teaching about fornication and holiness, maintaining purity. If the Thessalonians committed fornication, ignored the teaching of the Holy Spirit, then they would quench the Spirit. And you and I would be guilty of the same. I am certain that there are many who believe that if people are committed to one another and they're going to get married, then there's no reason to withhold oneself from a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And yet the Bible still teaches that fornication is sinful before God. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, sin it. So it actually is sin and rebellion to God. A person who knows he should obey the gospel and yet ignores the influence of the Holy Spirit exerted on his heart through the word of God is one who quenches the spirit. The spirit and the bride say come, Revelation twenty two seventeen. The Holy Spirit pleads with people through the message to obey the gospel. But a person who understands, I should obey the gospel, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to for this reason or that reason. And a person may come up with a list of excuses for not obeying the gospel. That is an individual who quenches the Spirit. One who ignores the instruction of the Holy Spirit to grow as a Christian, to study God's word, study to show thyself approved unto God, 2 Timothy 2.15. One who ignores the Spirit's teachings concerning assembling together to worship God, Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. One who rejects the Spirit's teachings to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. All of these would be ways one would quench the Spirit. I heard about two young women who died in a fire. The apartment where they lived caught on fire. The smoke alarms didn't go off and they died in the fire. It appears that 
previous occupants had disarmed the smoke detectors because they enjoyed candles and baking cookies and when they would the smoke detectors would go off so they disarmed the smoke detectors and in the absence of the warning two young women died the Holy Spirit teaches us, leads us, guides us, instructs and warns us through God's word and we dare not quench the spirit in our lives. Now let's consider in the second place this command and this duty. Despise not prophesying, verse 20. To despise something is to treat that person or thing with contempt. To act as if the thing under consideration is of no account, doesn't really matter. Here's an example. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools despise the wisdom of God because they don't want to live in keeping with it. So they despise it. They have disdain and contempt for it. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 9, we find that Jesus gave a parable for a specific reason stated in verse 9 of chapter 18, the book of Luke. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. He gave the parable concerning the publican and the sinner who both went up to the temple to pray. He gave that parable because the scribes and Pharisees, they believed they were superior to the publicans and the word says they despised others. They thought they were of no account. Going back to the text, the text reads, despise not prophesies. So Paul writes to these first century Christians encouraging them not to despise prophesying. A little while ago, we read from 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Do you remember in verse 10, we found there one of the gifts, miraculous gifts, was the gift of prophecy. So there were people in the first century church who were led in a miraculous way and they prophesied. A prophet, Old Testament or New Testament, was one who could foretell the future, but more than that, they were forth-tellers. Not only foretellers, but forth-tellers, meaning they spoke God's word. They spoke for God. They spoke to people about God's will for their lives. And so, when Paul writes, despise not prophesying, bear in mind, he's writing to people who were familiar with this gift of prophecy. It was a gift that Paul emphasized the importance of. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. Rather that ye prophesied. The Corinthians were coveting the gift of speaking in tongues. And Paul said, I would rather that you prophesy. Prophetic utterances were needed in the first century to build up, to instruct, to warn believers. They didn't have the benefit of turning to the book of 1 Thessalonians or 1 Corinthians because those books were in the process of being written and recorded. They didn't have the benefit that you and I have today of living on this side of the cross and having God's word in its complete and final form. We today can despise prophesying. There are no prophets here today. And yet there are those who speak God's word. A little while ago we read together from 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. Paul wrote to Timothy and instructing him to preach the word. No, that's not a prophecy predicting the future, but in the sense that Timothy was a preacher of God's word. 
then this idea of despising prophesyings could continue as someone despised faithful teaching of God's word. This is similar to quench not the spirit, but maybe a bit stronger. To quench the spirit may be to be indifferent toward the teaching of the spirit. But here is one who's not only indifferent, but he despises prophesies. He despises the faithful teaching of God's word. No, these things have passed away. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect, then that which is in part shall be done away. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10. So no one possesses the miraculous gift of prophecy today. And yet, we all are obligated to hear, believe, and obey the faithful teachings of the Word of God. I was preaching one Sunday in, in Tulsa, and I was about a third of the way, maybe finished with the lesson, and there was a gentleman about halfway back that stood up and it was apparent from the gesture, the look on his face, that something I had said disturbed him and he walked out. I didn't know what I'd said. But at the request of the elders there, I preached a sermon on dancing, drinking, immodesty, worldliness and right in the middle of that lesson this man stood up and walked out and later he made it clear why he walked out it was because he did not want to hear preaching about dancing drinking gambling immodesty he and his family were involved in these things and he did not want to hear it so he stood up and walked out of the assembly Amos was a faithful prophet of God sent to prophesy to the people of Israel. But he encountered a man whose name was Amaziah. And Amaziah said, in effect, you need to go back home. You're a troublemaker and we don't need you around here, Amos. Amos chapter 7 and verse 10. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus saith Amos, Jeroboam shall die by the sword and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, Go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel and it is the king's court. We don't want to hear all of this teaching about captivity and being taken into captivity. We don't want to hear that. So you, Amos, need to go back home. But Amos was a faithful prophet of God. He preached God's word, and just as he preached, God's people of Israel did fall. They did go into captivity in spite of the fact that Amaziah despised prophesying. Some today despise teaching about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. They've made up their minds how they want to live breaks our hearts that there are people in situations that are unscriptural regarding marriage, but we have the obligation to stand for truth. We are to love people and teach God's word with compassion, but some despise it. They don't want to hear it. There are those who despise teaching about the authority of the eldership. There are those who despise teaching about the one church of the New Testament. Sometimes a preacher preaches about baptism for the remission of sins. Someone objects, doesn't want to hear it. He despises prophesying. 
And so you and I, rather than despise the faithful teaching of God's word, we need to apply it to our lives, humbly accept it. Here's something else we need to do. This is the third duty, prove all things. Verse 21, to prove something in this context is to test it, prove all things. As you consider these prophesyings, Test them. That's the idea. That's the connection in the text. Test the prophets, prophets who come proclaiming a message. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. If a prophet came in the first century, they were to try the spirits. Again, one of the spiritual gifts given in the first century church was the gift of discerning spirits. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. So there were those who had the miraculous ability to discern a spirit, whether that spirit was on God's side or not. Today, we still need to prove all things. No miraculous gifts today. But you, right where you are today, can test what I'm saying against the teaching of the Word of God. And that is precisely the responsibility that I have and that we all have. Acts chapter 17 is a great example of what it means to test all things. Concerning the noble Bereans, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. I would never encourage someone to accept what I say simply because I say it. I'm a fallible, weak human being, subject to making mistakes and errors. Check what I say with your Bible. I know it's right. I would never intentionally teach anything wrong, and yet we all need to prove all things, test all things. Rather than testing all things, some never test anything. You know what they do? They take the pastor's word for it. Whatever he says is golden. Good old brother so-and-so said it, and it must be right. They don't open their Bibles. They don't, maybe don't even have a Bible. If they do, they might not know where it is. But they know what they believe because what they believe is what the pastor said. But what the pastor, denominational term, said may not be in the Bible. It may not be right. And too much is at stake to simply blindly accept the teaching of a man. We need to prove all things. Some, rather than proving things, rely on their feelings. They rely on tradition. And yet the Bible still says, prove all things. And then there's a fourth duty. Quickly, Paul writes, hold to that which is good. As you prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. In the context, hold on to the good teachings. Those that you've tested and tried and found them to be true, hold on to, the, to them. Because God has made his will clear in your mind and heart, apply it. You've tested it, you found it to be true, now hold on to it. You and I need to hold on to the teachings of God's word concerning his marvelous, amazing grace. We need to hold on to the teaching about God's mercy he is a God of mercy and compassion. What the Bible says about obedience to the gospel, we need to hold on to that teaching. The Bible teaches that we must obey the gospel to be saved. We need to hold on to faithful teachings regarding forgiveness, the promise of heaven, all of these wonderful promises in God's word. Having tested these things, we want to hold on to them. And then we come to the final duty. Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Sometimes this text is abused 
and it is abused because of a misunderstanding regarding the term appearance. Abstain from all appearance. The word appearance can have at least two different meanings. One, it can mean seems to be the case. Here's an example. It appears to be evil to go into a bar on a Friday night. That may appear to be evil to some. Well, why would it appear? Well, it seems to be evil. It looks as if it would be evil because of what goes on in bars on a Friday night. So it appears to be evil, therefore you should abstain from it. There's another meaning of the word appearance. The word appearance can mean to be visible or to appear. Here's an example. President Trump made an appearance at his rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He made an appearance. He was visible there. So President Trump was visible. He appeared actually and literally. It didn't seem to be the case that he was there. No, he was there. He appeared. He was actually there, visible. That's the way the word appearance is used in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 22. And in the context, that which is evil is in contrast to that which is good, the latter part of verse 21. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. The teachings that you've tried and found to be true and good and right, hold on to them. And while you're holding on to the good teachings, abstain from those that are evil. Having tested all the prophesyings and teachings of God's word, if there is a teaching on the scene, it has appeared, it's made its appearance, just as Trump appeared in Tulsa, now this teaching has made its appearance rejected if it's evil. If it's not in keeping with what God has said, you should reject it. There are some evil teachings that have made their appearance today. The one who teaches that God still speaks to people apart from his word. A preacher stands and tells people, now I'm being led of God today. God laid this on my heart. No, he didn't. Because he has already revealed all truth to the apostles. John 16, 13. And they recorded, they and other inspired writers, they've recorded God's revelation and it's been once and for all given to the saints, Jude verse 3. So no one is being led in a miraculous way today. That's an evil teaching, and we all should reject it. We should reject false teachings concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We should reject the teaching that has become more prevalent in our day, that there's no such thing as hell. Hell is not eternal. If there is a place called hell, it's not eternal. Some teach that. The Bible doesn't teach it. There are those who teach there is no such thing as absolute truth. And yet the Bible throughout teaches that God's word is true. And you and I have an obligation to believe and obey. When false teachings are on the scene, we need to reject them. Abstain from all appearance of evil. We need to abstain from going into the bar on Friday night. That appears to be evil. But that's not the way we should apply 1 Thessalonians 5.22 in the context. That's not what Paul is saying. Other passages teach that principle. But this passage teaches when there is error being taught, test it and reject it. Hold on to the good and reject the evil. These are some duties which if we keep we will stay close to God. Paul knew that, and that's why he encouraged these brethren in first century Thessalonica to do these things. You and I still need to uh, apply these duties to our lives. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And abstain from all appearance of evil. Determine today that you will not only read God's word, but that you will honor it. You will apply it to your life. Someone said a little while ago, I thought about that sermon on prayer this last week. It came to my mind. 
Well, we all need to apply, not only hear, but apply God's word to our lives. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We shouldn't be indifferent toward the teaching of God's word. It's too marvelous, it's too precious, and too wonderful. Let's resolve that we will love God's word, we will hold on to it all the days of our lives, so that when we leave this world, heaven will be our home. We're going to sing a song of invitation. If you have never obeyed the gospel, do that while there's time and opportunity. Don't quench the spirit. Believe and obey the gospel today. Put your faith in Christ. Turn from your sins in repentance. Confess your faith and be baptized for the remission of sins. You'll be a Christian. And then you can live your life for Christ. And you can know that heaven will be your home. If you need to come home as an erring child of God, we're going to encourage you to do that. As we sing the song that has been announced, if you need to respond, won't you come as we stand and sing?